Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jay. How are you doing uh, this lovely afternoon? I'm doing great. It's, uh, it's like 69 degrees in Dallas right now, so it's like springtime. I know everybody else is freezing, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's about uh, it's about 40 here, so it's not nearly as cold as it has been, but it's not where I would like it to be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot has changed for you, and this is the last time you and I sat down and talked. You are self-published now, is that right? Yeah, I've been self-publishing off and on over the several years, but um, I... I'm not currently under contract with New York, so most of the work I'm doing is or has been self-published. Okay, and what uh, can you talk about what led to that decision and what how that has been different for you? Um, well, I, um, I had a series, the Prosper's War series, um, that was um, pretty popular with readers, but um, I think it, it came out like at a weird time. It was basically like right before the urban fantasy bubble burst in New York. Um, and of course, it was doing well in self-publishing. So after a while, I was getting so many emails from readers asking if I was going to finish the series that I was like, you know, may maybe it's worth trying this on my own. Um, and so I put the fourth book in the series, Volatile Bonds, out in... This is 2017, September of 2017, I think. Um and so, you know, that was a great learning experience. It was, um, you know, I was lucky enough to sort of already have editors that I knew and cover designers that I knew and reviewers that I could talk to and bookstores that would carry it. So that made the whole process much easier than it would have been if I'd never, you know, if I was starting from scratch, basically. Um, so I just started there. And then in February, the following February, I put out um, Highland Some Sound. Uh, which is a sort of a gothic, uh, southern gothic book. And um, so really it's just a way to make sure that my fans can still read my stories even if New York has sort of moved on to new trends. Okay. Mm -hmm. huh. And where did the idea to do like uh, the haunted coal mine kind of small town type deal come from? So Highland Sound was a book that I wanted to write for several years. I was watching TV one day and it was like a reality show and this woman was talking about how she was from the mountains of North Carolina and every spring they celebrated something called Decoration Day, uh, which I'd never heard of, but it, it turns out it's this sort of precursor to Memorial Day that's celebrated every spring in mountain communities where, um, you know, after the long winter where everybody's sort of isolated, they all come together. They do, you know, sort of, business for the region they have a picnic on the ground which is similar to like day of the dead um anyway it just sounds kind of cool i've never heard of it before and because i have this warped writer's brain my thinking because they, they were also saying they don't really know the origins of it yeah and warped writer's brain goes well they do it because they have to or the dead will come back yeah um, you're like of course because you're a writer too that's exactly yeah. where you gone with it and so I said you know I should do something with this so I kind of noodled on it for a few years every now and then I you know pick up a book and you know research the traditions and you know characters would sort of whisper to me um, ideas and things and then uh, I started graduate school in I don't even know what year it was it was the year Dirty Magic came out and uh, I had to write a novel for my master's degree and I thought you know I'm paying all this money and putting all this time into it I don't want to just phone in a book that I know I can write to get my degree I don't want to just write the next book in this series turn it in get my degree I want to push myself so um, I decided I was finally going to write this decoration day book um, and so not only did I want to write a different genre and a different style of book, but I also was like, you know, I'm not going to write it in first person, which all my other books are, because I want to see if I can write third person, multiple point of view really well. So it was really just kind of a an experiment in pushing my boundaries a little bit and seeing if I had chops in, in other styles of writing that, you know, I hadn't tried before. Yeah. Um, so that was where it started, but then, you know, when the story itself ended up being inspired by, you know, bluegrass music and, 
there's a there's actually a song by John Lee Hooker called Decoration Day. Um, and he talks about how he had a woman and he was so in love with her and she died and now he goes and visits her every decoration day. And that song was the inspiration for the character of Cotton in the book, who is sort of the town drunk whose wife has recently died. Um, so there are a lot of different influences on the story. It was fun. Uh, yeah, that's something that struck me right away was that it was from different points of views. And I was like, well, this is different. But it's it's done very, very well. Um, I uh, Peter, the author, is a very interesting character. Um, he has a very troubled relationship with his ex-wife. Um, I I thought the introduction to his character was uh, felt very real. Um, but he's very, like... Uh, he almost comes off nar narcissistic at times. Um, have you ever actually met anybody that that's kind of like that? <laughs> Not to name names. I think every writer is a narcissist to some point, uh, some extent. Uh, not we're not all malignant narcissists, but yeah. you know we all have that tendency a little bit. Um, I have certainly met some writers who uh, influenced Peter, um, but nobody directly. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get that guy. Um, it's, he's sort of an amalgam of different traits that I've seen in writers. And, uh, you know, some of my writer friends who read the book have been like, you know, you really took this unflinching look at him and what it's like to be a writer and how we can sort of in the service of writing, you know, end up using people. Um, and, you know, I think that writers can be the most narcissistic, but at the same time, the most insecure people in the room, literally at the same time. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so I wanted to kind of just explore that. I mean, he's obviously for the sake of fiction, um, a lot of things were exaggerated. I mean, the, the introductory scene with him where he meets his ex-wife in a bookstore and um, she's delivering some news he's not so happy about. He's just this asshole. I mean, he's just terrible. Um, but I wanted him to be because he's not the main character of the book. Uh, Ruby is the main character. Right. He's sort of. He's sort of a co-protagonist, and he has his own character arc. But, you know, I I was sort of... Okay, so I was sort of um, responding to um, Salem's Lot uh, by Stephen King and Ghost Story by Peter Straub. Yeah. Okay, so if you've read those books, you know that they're very similar. They both start with a, a writer who's coming back to a small town... They, the first scene is them running off with a child. You don't know the, why they're running off with this child. The books are very similar, and you can almost see it's like those two responding to each other yeah. um, in the stories. And so I wanted to write to both of them and be like, okay, but in my book, the writer isn't the hero. Uh, this girl is. Um, because I felt like uh, I didn't want to write a story where another white male author is the hero. I don't know. I like Peter. Um, I think he has probably the most dramatic arc of anybody in the book. Uh, you haven't, I don't think you've read the end yet, but, um, he has a really steep arc and I wanted him to have one. Um, but I also didn't want it to be like when the man walks on the page, we're like, okay, the hero's here. Yeah. I, the hero is Ruby. The book starts with her and ends with her and, um, it's really her story, but he also has his own story. So I was just playing with that. Yeah, and his interaction with the, um, uh, I guess, religious group of the town. Uh, the town is very religious because you mentioned the sort of uh, th that they have to do this this thing, otherwise something bad might happen. Right. Um, where was where did the inspiration for uh, like that specific group come from? Well, I really with. Um, with the world first. Um, so I sort of like started with, okay, you've got this scenario where you have a small town where they have to do this ritual. And, and I leave it sort of vague in the book about how much everybody knows about the underpinnings of the ritual. 
Um, there's a lot of different stories about, you know, even within the town, what the truth is. Um, but I sort of started with that scenario of, um, if this situation, what, what would the people in town look like who took part in that? And the, the character that really jumped out for me initially was Deacon Fry, um, who is the head of the Deacon Council for the church. Um, he's also the mayor of the town. And it took me a while when he showed up and I was writing him as Deacon Fry, Deacon Fry, Deacon Fry. That I was like, wait a second, he's not actually ordained. Um, deacons are lay members of, of a church. And so it's like, how would this guy who isn't ordained be the leader? And so I just started, well, if that's the case, when he is the leader, why isn't he in charge? And I just sort of asked questions about how this would look. And, you know, I find in my books that if I do enough world building before I sit down to write, these things sort of write themselves. Because yeah. once I create the sandbox um, with specific specifications, certain people show up there as products of this world. So I don't, I don't always know exactly how they're not always created, um, with any sort of, you know, I'm, with strategy. I'm not strategizing. I'm like, who, who walks onto the page? Why are they there? Um, how are they a product of this town? That kind of stuff. So, okay. And a lot of, uh, my favorite vlogs from you are about like outlining and bullet journaling. So is, are you saying that maybe Highlands of Sound was a bit more pantsy or do you do more outlining this time around? Uh, I actually outline, well, I don't outline in the traditional sense. I don't sit down before I write a book and write an outline. I sit down and I do a lot of pre-work that is research and world building. Um, and then I sort of write a by the seat of my pants draft um, that that's usually um, just a collection of scenes out of order. Things that after I have my world, I'm like, OK, what would happen here? And sort of out of the situation, I create these scenes pop up and these characters pop up and I just get down everything I can about them. And then once I get to a point where I don't like nothing else is coming to me. I sit down like, okay, what do I have here? And that's sort of when I outline using a storyboard. So I'll, um, here, I can show you a storyboard, just a second. Okay. So this is a storyboard. I don't know how it probably gets it very well, but it's basically a poster board. Yeah. It has four rows. Each row is an act. Um, and I will basically take, take scenes write a brief summary of each scene and slap them up on a storyboard and say, this sort of feels like something that would happen in the second act. This sort of feels, you know, first act-ish. Um, and I just play with it and move them around. I call it puzzling. Um, and I just look at what I have. And then I see from what I have, what story would grow from that. It's, it's a really organic process. Uh, it is not a process that I would recommend if you can write a book any other way, because I literally never know if the story is going to come together until the end. <laughs> oh, wow. They always seem to come together. Um, but, uh, it's not a pretty process, but I do know that I, you know, I had an editor, my editor at Orbit, Davey Pillay, who's really amazing and taught me a lot about writing. Um, she forbade me to outline because the only book I sent her that I did outline beforehand was terrible <laughs> because with the way that my mind is wired, if I have to do things in order and linearly, then I'm going to fall back and rely too much on formula. Right. So I end up writing really formulaic books when I outline. So it's better for me to sort of, uh, more organic process because I may still end up following a plot structure that's, um, you know, sort of within the conventions of the genre, but I'm not forcing things to fall in line one right after another, like every other book you've read. Yeah. So, so, they, so they can end up being kind of twisty turny. There's still a structure to them, but the structure comes after I have a lot of this raw material to work with. And, so. Where did your idea to start uh, bullet journaling come from? 
Well, I think like a lot of things, it started as a, a procrastination tool. Uh, I, you know, I was sort of like, oh, I'm going to get myself organized instead of writing. Um, cause I probably was trying to avoid writing one day. Yeah. Um, but I also found that, you know, I don't have a typical career. I don't have a job where I have meetings every day and, you know, days could go by without me leaving the house, uh, or talking to a real human other than my family. And so, um, I didn't like the agendas that I could find at like Barnes and Noble or, you know, they, they all, I didn't like the layout. So I thought, well, I can make this anything I want it to be and I can keep everything in one place. Um, and so it really started that way. It was also kind of a creative exercise a little bit. Um, cause I got to try different layouts and, you know, uh, I, I find something inspiring and I'd create like a little page and I just see stickers and yeah. colored markers and stuff, you know? Um, so that's kind of how it started. I have sort of fallen away from doing it as often as I used to. And some of that I just have learned is I'm not going to beat myself up about it because it's just my personality. I don't do well with that kind of structure. I did though get this new thing. This is the, uh, what's it called? The Evo planner. I basically fell for an Instagram marketing campaign. <laughs> okay. Uh, and this is the one where, uh, they have four different personality types. There's like alchemist and, uh, Oracle and architect and something else. And you'd like take this personality test and they're like, Oh, well, if you're this type, then this is the kind of planner you need. Well, uh, I, really bought it because I'm an alchemist according to their system. And I was like, well, that is perfect. Yeah, it is. Alchemy. Um, and it's kind of a cool planner because, you know, they say like for my, my personality type, um, it's very important to share your discoveries with people. Um, so I'm always researching these weird things that I just find fascinating and they're like, that's part of it. And then you also need to share it. Um, so everything's about like, how are you going to share your discoveries today? And sometimes that's, I'll write a blog post. Sometimes it's, I'll go get on Twitter and talk about this thing I'm thinking of, or I'll share a book that I'm reading on Instagram or cause it, I am an extrovert. And so it is important for me to have that part of it. Um, so I've been doing that, but mostly just a plain old to do list works yeah. really well. Well, that's cool. I'd never, i never heard of that. Uh, but that's, it's funny that, that you ended up with that specific journal, but it, they were right. It actually, it, it does work for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it also said that for me type, like you're not the kind that uses a journal every single day. Um, so like it's only a three month worth of journal. Um, I think it's a little overpriced, frankly, I'm not buying into their whole system. So I'm not like, I mean, I'm not a paid person sponsoring the system, but, um, I just, I just thought it was neat and I wanted to try it. And so, you know, I'll sit down and I'll do the little, you know, if I have a busy day, like I'll go through and say, you know, what are my priorities for today? And it breaks it down. It breaks it down by like subtext. Yeah. Like I I say for a class and it was like, I need to read the assignments, need to write the prompt. I need to mind map for this essay I want to write. And, you know, so it's, it's a cute little thing, but I could have done it on a piece of paper. <laughs> right. I mean, you, you never know until you try, right? Sure. Um, and with High Lots of Sound, you're also doing an audio book. And uh, talk about how that's uh, been different from doing other audio books for uh, your, not, your past books. So I only would work with an, an audiobook publisher, even with uh, Volatile Bonds, which I self-published, I had a, have a contract with Tantor uh, to do the um, audiobooks, and so they um, made sure that I had the same narrator I had with the books before they were self-published and, you know, things like that. So, but with this one, I went through ACX and I put up the audition and I had something like 104 auditions in a week. Oh, wow. Um, book, which was 
very fun, but also very overwhelming because they were all so, so good. And yeah. I didn't know going into it exactly what I wanted. So I, I asked for male and female narrators. So it was really interesting, that whole process. Um, I ended up going um, with this uh, amazing female narrator named Rebecca Roberts, who um, she's done some other work too. I can't remember the other authors she's worked with, but she just really, um, her voice is really great. Um, and I think she has sort of a natural storyteller's. Uh, delivery, which was, I think, important for a book set in Appalachia because, you know, it's such a storyteller sort of culture. Um, so anyway, she uh, knocked it out of the park as far as I'm concerned with the audio. Um, we worked together. She would, um, you know, submit chapters as she finished them and I'd listen and say, oh, hey, you know, this, you know, fix this, fix that. Uh, but there wasn't a lot. Yeah. A lot of it was just little differences in pronunciation based on region or something. Um, and so, and then we submitted it. So now it's basically in queue with ACX waiting for it to be approved. And I'm hoping that by the end of this week, I'll have the final approval and it'll be up so I can share with people because that book came out about a year ago. And I know, um, you know, it's, it's important to me because I know so many people just love audio, but I also, you know, think that there are a lot of people who need audiobooks because of accessibility, and I want to be sure that my work is accessible as possible. Um, so I've had high lonesome sound done in audio, and I'm currently working on having a short story collection uh, called The Chosen Ones, which is a, it's a collection of Sabina Kane short stories and novellas, and one Kate Prosper novella put into a um, compilation. Right. It's so I'm basically at the tail end of working with a different narrator for that one. Her name is Melanie. I don't remember her last name at the moment. Um, but she's doing a great job with Sabina and Kate, and those will probably be out, I would think, by March, depending on how long it takes them to get approved. So it's been a really fun process. And, you know, I wrote both of these books or a lot of these stories a long time ago, so it's been fun to sort of revisit them and hear them in a different way. Um, especially Highlands and Sound because it really it didn't feel like listening to something I had written it it felt like listening to something somebody else had written and I um, I was like hey this is pretty good <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah it's like who wrote this oh yeah it was me <laughs> that's really good um, so I'm hoping that you know it'll help new people discover that story because I, I know it's a little bit off brand for me but I that is that book is definitely a book of the heart for me. It just, um, I put a lot into that book. It took me two years to write. And, um, I don't know. I love all my books, but that one's, that one was really special for a lot of reasons. So, yeah. Uh, well, congratulations on that. That's, uh, that's really exciting. Um, so, uh, will it be like physical discs or will it be just strictly like an MP3 type deal? Yeah. It'll just, um, automatically, um, uh, iTunes and um, the electronic version. Okay. I don't even know. Do they make the discs anymore? I I don't know. I can't recall the last time I saw like a physical audiobook that was you know recent. But uh... well, I'm spoiled. I have an Audible subscription, you know, and because uh, I listen to a lot of audiobooks and. Like, I'm so spoiled because, you know, I, I forget that I, like, pay a monthly fee. I just go on and I'm like, click, you know. <laughs> so yeah. It's like, free. Because <laughs> I remember when they used to be, like, 75 bucks for that, you know, massive thing of discs that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, so something that really stuck out to me uh, when I read Deadly Spells, the third Prosperous War book, and I'm curious if it was on purpose, I felt like the the supporting characters were even more fleshed out in the, than they were in the first two books because it's like by part three we've kind of gotten a feel for who Kate is but I felt like you did a really terrific job of um, going more into the background and who everybody else is around her was that something that you did on purpose? Um, well yes obviously I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, 
I, I mean, I think it's natural, uh, you know, a few books into the series that, um, you know, one of the reasons you have these large ensemble casts is so that you can have all these different directions to go in. Um, and, you know, I know in that book, you know, Gardner's backstory is a really big part of um, the plot. And so for me, it's just really some of it's that I get curious and I want to know their backstories uh, a little bit more because I don't know every single detail about all of my characters. Um, we have a guest star. Yeah, yeah. Um, cat. Um, I. So it's I don't plan the books out ahead, really. I sort of when I sit down to write, I sort of have an idea of the crime. Um, I know the alchemical stage that I'm talking about um, in the in the book, and that that impacts what crime it is. It impacts the sort of settings and characters that'll show up, and um, and it also impacts though the character arcs because there's this idea in alchemy. Uh, there's this idea that alchemy is not only like a physical science; it's also sort of a, a symbolic um, psychological process that alchemists go through to transform into um, enlightenment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So each stage of, of each book reflects a stage of psychological development. So sometimes Kate may not be the one having the biggest change. She usually does, but, um, you know, there are other characters and their subplots sort of buttress those themes. So I'll focus on them a little bit more. Um, but that, I mean, that's what's so fun for me. I mean, the characters really, the world and the, and sort of seeing the characters moving around in it and change. And I think, you know, in really good series, everybody changes. Yeah. Um, so it's important to sort of show what's happening with other people because they're all there for a reason. They're not just there to sort of be interesting props um, or to create problems for your main character. They're also there um, to explore themes within the world. Um, so that's a long answer. Yeah, I, no. I, I mean, I sort of did it on purpose, but I also didn't. <laughs> so it's uh, from what, I understand it's it's very natural uh, because they're you know they're although they're fictional they're still people. Sure, um, and I'll sit down and I'll say at the beginning when I'm trying to figure out what's going to happen I'll write a list of the main characters and I'm like what's happening with each of these people in this book, um, and that's because at this point like I've written several books and so I'm like okay where did I leave Pin where did I leave Shady where did I leave Mez is something developing with that, with their story within this story? Is that a subplot? Is it part of the main plot? You know, because people want to know what's going on with Volos and they want to know what's going on with um, Gardner, even if they're not a part of the main plot. Yeah. Because everybody's, you know, especially when you're talking about like Morales and, Vol and Volos, you got a team Morales, you got team Volos among certain readers. Really? You know, there, there are people that, that, that ship Volos? Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know what, though? People are so funny because in <laughs> the Sabina King series, people ship the ghoul and Sabina. So, um, and he was a, you know, a mischief demon who is also a hairless cat. Yeah, and yeah. People are like, are Sabina and Gagol going to get together? I'm like, I, absolutely not. <laughs> are they going to get together? <laughs> you know? Wow. So, we ship who we ship, you know? Yeah. Yeah, personally, I think he's kind of a jerk, um, to put it lightly. Um, yeah. He's interesting. Like, I love that character. Um, and I, I like, not. I'm not going to spoil anything, but I like what you do with him in that third book because I think it complicates things for uh, for Kate, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, Have you read the book yet? Huh? Have you read the book, book four yet? Not yet. I'm going to finish High Lonesome Sound, and I, I promise I will absolutely... No, no, no. I'm not, it's not like I'm quizzing you. It's just you don't know that <laughs> yeah. there's more of those stuff. I mean, you know, like, this is the thing uh, that's so funny for me, because, you know, a lot of urban fantasy fans, not all of them, but a big a majority of them come from sort of romance. You know, you've got, like, people who come to urban fantasy from fantasy. You've got people who come from romance. You've got people who come from horror you know, the police procedural fans who don't mind paranormal. 
So you have all these different fan uh, points of view coming in. And so people are always like, oh, well, you know, at the end of of X book, she was with this guy. So that must be who she's going to be with. And I'm like, this is not a romance. You don't even know if all these people are going to live, you know? And so it's really funny when people get so invested in one relationship or another, because really those relationships are there to make her grow. Um, You know, she may end up with somebody, uh, but you know, there's no guarantees. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's how real life works. So it makes, it makes perfect sense. Well, and the thing too, open fantasy is not, I mean, I, I really love the romance genre and I read a lot of romance actually, but, um, it's a different sort of journey in urban fantasy. Um, it's, it's, you know, in romance, the journey of self growth is through a relationship with another person in urban fantasy. <laughs> It's about the main character's growth, um, and that 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 journey includes romance, and it includes friendships, and it includes career and whatever. But those are not um, it, the, none of those things in isolation are more important than the other. The yeah. romance is more important than the job, usually. So, anyway, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, and speaking about talking animals. Uh, so you mentioned that, uh, I, I, I always butcher his name, Gagool. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay, good. Um, what was the, how did you decide to make him a uh, hairless cat? <laughs> so, for those who haven't read those books, when Gagool shows up in that those Sabina Kane series, he is a seven foot tall, green scaled, black horned, cloven hoofed demon. Yeah. He's a mischief demon um, who can shape shift into the form of a cat because I needed him to be able to be in sort of a, a portable body so that he could go around with her. I mean, you can't have a seven foot tall green demon walking around with you in L.A. Right. Um, although L.A. and New York probably could get away with it more than other places. But um, anyway, so I needed him to be able to shape shift into a portable animal form. Um, and I had had the idea of having a hairless cat in those books before I even wrote them. And it is because of an episode of Friends um, where I think it's Ross gives Rachel a, a hairless cat as a gift. Okay. And it freaks her out so bad. She's like, I swear it hisses, Rachel. Like, she's like, this cat is evil. And I just, I was like, if any cat is going to be a demon, it's going to be a hairless cat. And so... <laughs> That just kind of stuck in my mind forever. And so when I sat down to write this series, I was like, well, I wanted to have a, a sidekick uh, or a familiar. Um, and originally, I really played with the idea of, like, maybe he was already in her life or, you know, I couldn't really make it work. And then suddenly the scene occurred to me where this demon shows up and she kind of gets stuck with him. Now, the hairlessness came later in the book when Sabina's trying to sort of, like, send him home and a spell goes wrong, and she ends up basically turning him into a hairless cat. Right. Yeah, I remember. So that's how he ends up hairless. But um, the idea of it really did come from friends, and it just amused me because they're so creepy adorable. Yeah, they absolutely are. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, What do you think it is about talking to animals that people love so much? I think some of the things is that we wish our own pets could talk. You know, like we... We have, like, such a relationship with them, but we can't speak to them. I mean, I do. I talk to my dogs all the time, um, and then I pretend that they talk back to me. You know, like, I, I think most pet owners do something like that. But um, yeah. I think it's just this idea of being able to communicate with them, but also, I don't know. But you know what's interesting is you never see the animal who is, like, not smart right like they're always super wise like smarter than their master or whatever in some ways although I mean I guess you know Kevin Hearn's um his uh oh my god Oberon um acts mostly like a dog you know uh he's sort of into you know the sausage jokes and all of that but um I don't know. 
know. I just think I just think it's a fun detail, and I, you know, for me, I needed Sabina to have. She needed some some somebody in her life that sort of was like an agent of chaos, like someone who didn't buy her BS or her bluster and sort of called her on stuff, like the the best friend who's like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. Uh, but also somebody who sort of pushed her out of her comfort zone. Um, and he, you know, he wasn't really a cat. I mean, he was a demon. So there's that whole thing of like, he literally was a mischief demon. Um, so his job was to create mischief for her. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I think it's just a fun, you know, element. I love, I love an urban fantasy where there's, I, you know, my first urban fantasy series I ever read was Kim Harrison's Dead Witch Walking. I was so blown away by that book. I'd never seen anything like it in fiction. And of course she had Jinx, who was the fairy sidekick, who sort of is the same idea of having this other being who's different, who has a different sort of wisdom and who's helpful and can get into places you can't. And it's just like a helper. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I just think it's fun. Uh, and, and it is a lot of fun because he kind of mirrors her in a different way. Cause she's like, very like no BS kind of person, but he's kind of, he's, he's like, he's like the funny character in a lot of ways. Like he has a lot of funny scenes. Well, it's definitely comic release. So much of those books, you know, it's, it's fight scenes and there's angst and you know, whatever. And frankly, as a new writer, when I was writing those books, I needed, you know, Google was sort of like my, you know, when I would put myself in a corner, Google would save me. You know, so I'm like, okay, it's gotten really, really dark. I don't know where to go from here. And all of a sudden, Google would make a dick joke, you know, or, <laughs> you know, like, like he just got me out of a lot of problems. Um, and people loved him. And, um, you know, I, I think now I, don't use stuff like that quite as much. I mean, it's certainly in the Prospero series, you've got Little Man and, you know, these hot sort of... Hot Pocket. <laughs> you have Hot Pocket. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these side characters, but I think I, um, I don't necessarily need somebody with Kate all the time to get her out of spots because I'm a more confident writer. So she has like real relationships with a bunch of really quirky characters who kind of come in and out. But I, I'm a little bit more comfortable with things being dark for a longer amount of time. I don't know. It's hard to explain. But, um, yeah. but you, I mean, you certainly, you've got Baba. She's funny. You've got Little Man. You've got like stuff like Hot Pocket, who is actually, to me, a tragic, tragic character um, that's played in a funny way. But there's a lot of... Um, he's actually, you know, this, this reflection of like how terrible the real world actually can be, you yeah. know? Um, so anyway, um, I just have fun. I have fun playing with all these different people. Do you have uh, a, a favorite side character? If you could pick one from like each series. Okay, well, I'm going to pick... Obviously, the the obvious answer would be Gagool and like Baba and these people. But for Sabina's series, my favorite side character that I wish I had had a chance to write more about is Queen Maeve, who is the fairy queen who, um, over the course of a year, she goes through all stages of woman. So, like, it, in the springtime, she's a child. In the summertime, she's in her adolescence. In the fall, she's middle-aged. And in the winter, she's, at, like, an old crone. Um, I really love her as a character, and I, I wish I had written more about her. Maybe I will at some point. Um, for Kate, for Prospero, I really love Mez. Um, I'd like to get more into some of Mez's background, I think. Um, I think I probably will do that in the future, put, put more of a spotlight on his story. So, and how many more books do you have, uh, a certain planned amount for the Prosperous War? Um, my plan along has been seven. Okay. Um, 
that's because uh, there are sort of like generally accepted seven stages of alchemy. Some systems have more or less, but for me to get her through that full arc, uh, it will take seven. Um, and, I, you know, I've been sort of avoiding getting back to those books. And I think part of it is, is that I like part of me doesn't want them to be done. Right. Um, mostly because a lot of it is about a lot of these books and, you know, people will look at urban fantasy and they're like, Oh, those are just entertainment. Well, for me, they're not. I mean, like I really good urban fantasy isn't just about fights and demons and whatever. Like there are metaphors for like a lot of deeper things. And, and so it's hard for me to write her going through this sort of identity revolution um without also having it sort of reflect stuff happening in my own life so it's a weird sort of like i'm pushing her and myself as i write the book but that may be more like inside baseball than most readers want to know but it's just um it's hard to write about somebody getting an identity crisis without sort of having your own (laughs) right yeah because our characters end up reflecting ourselves in a lot of ways yeah well, and most people wouldn't know it. Like, the only person who probably gets how much of myself or is in my books is my husband because, you know, he hears me talk about them all the time and then he'll read them. And he's like, oh, so the subplot here about the, you know, whatever, you're really talking about this thing that really happened. And it's just through so many layers of, like, symbol and metaphor that nobody else would get it. And sometimes I don't even get it that that's what I'm writing about, but it, it all ends up in there. So, you know, which is good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, it, I think Stephen King put it in a way one time that he puts his like nightmares and fears and problems on the page. Instead of going into a therapist, people pay him to uh, put that off onto them. Oh, uh, like bleeding the bad. Oh, yeah. You know? um, so, I mean, and, and honestly, what's so funny about that is, like, uh, most of the horror writers that I know are the nicest people. And they're, like, really sweet, like, neurotic people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, use their neurosis to create these stories and, you know, but they, like, get rid of all of it. Yeah. So... It's interesting. No, I I completely agree with that. It's like as a horror writer, people expect me to be like this 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 scary person, but uh, it's like talking to you. It's like that's not the case at all. Obviously, I I went to a reading, um, at once in this small town, and this guy was helping me bring books in for my car. He was really nice, and he was you know I've read your books, and I'm like really. He's like you are not at all what I expected. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I see you like dressed in all black and be sort of a witchy goth person. And I am like, you know, suburban soccer mom when you see me in person. Like, I'm not at all like imposing or scary, I guess. But um, I was like, no, I just have this really dark imagination. <laughs> yeah. And I get it out. And then, no, I don't create dark drama in my life because it's just, it's there. It's just out of the way. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's therapeutic in a way. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Um, what are what would be the limits that of stuff that you would put onto the page? Like, do you do you have limits of what you will show or say? Has has it come across to where he's like you put something on the page and you're like, I don't know if I can really go that far or if I should. I mean, there are things that I have written out that I wish I would have handled them differently. Um, in one of the Prospero books, uh, it's Cursed Moon, there's this, um, there's a scene where they're showing up at the, sort of the tail end of this a scene on a college campus where somebody has spiked all of the alcohol and the women are raping the men. Um, on campus and I wish I had not been 
so I wasn't, I don't think I was like crazy gratuitous in that, but there were some, there was probably a little too much detail. And I, you know, from my point of view, I was sort of trying to make a comment about um, people pretending that like men don't get raped, or, like it's funny if a man gets raped or something, um, which I don't think it is at all. No. Uh, it's all a violation, it's all terrible. Um, and so I kind of wanted to like play with, you know, the male's reactions to it. And, you know, so I was, I was going for that, but I think in the end, I probably went a little too far. Um, and I wish I had handled it with a little more subtlety because I certainly, you know, never want to like traumatize my readers or, um, I don't always talk about happy things. And usually I'm, I'm trying to like shine a light on something and the problem with that is sometimes the light can be a little too glaring and I didn't get a bunch of letters or anything about it. I mean, I know there were some readers who were not happy with it. Um, and I get it when you go into a book to escape the real world and then suddenly like there's a scene that's very upsetting. It can be hard. So I don't know. There's stuff like that, but like, you know, I obviously, have my own lines uh, you know I don't want to read about children being hurt I don't want to write about it um, I uh, and there's some stuff that just I find too scary to write about you know? like like I you know I was raised Catholic so like demon possession actually scares the hell out of me and so I write about demons, but I write about them anyway. So you probably will never see me write like a, you know, a real demon possession book. Uh, or, I don't know. I, I guess the line is, I don't want to exploit anybody and I don't want to be gratuitous um, unless the gratuitousness is for a purpose. But, but then it wouldn't be gratuitous. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. It's because it's, it's a really tricky climate right now for everybody. I think, and everyone's sort of afraid of <sighs> offending people, which we should be. We don't want to, you know, exploit or marginalize people, um, and we don't want. I don't want to hurt people um but the other you know i i think a lot about the line it, you know it's fiction um we're not writing about i mean you can write about an idealized world in fiction and you can write about the way the world really is in fiction um and there's i don't know where that line is um you know because i write about bad people and bad people say and do bad things in my books, and people say, well, she thinks that. Well, I don't think that. That's what that bad person did. Right. Bad people do stuff like that. Um, so it's a tough line. I think I usually just try and trust my gut. But there are a couple things that I'm like, mm. Like in um, the fourth Prospero book, um, I don't know. I worry that I treated the character of Aphrodite in a, a way that wasn't um, that it could be perceived as me not being sensitive um, to some things and I actually am extremely sensitive to them but it's just you never know what's going to set people off and what isn't so I don't know it's tricky yeah no I, I completely agree I think you just kind of have to wade the water as best you can and pray that you don't step on anything or anybody well it's hard because certain things that you just are blind spots for you. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody, I mean, I'd like to think most people don't set out to be insensitive or harmful. Um, but there are just things that, you know, you don't think of that, like it wouldn't even occur to you. Somebody might get upset about. Um, and so you hope that somebody might, might kindly say to you, Hey, the way you handled this wasn't great. And then you have to be mature enough to listen to it and take it in and, and question it and be thoughtful about it and think, you know, how can I do better? Um, 
But as far as the lines I won't cross, really, I think you can do almost anything. It, it is not for shock value or to exploit people or, um, I don't know. Cause I, some, some new writers, it's like, they, they're like, I'm going to write the, the, the most over the top thing I can. Um, but it doesn't really serve the story. Right. So. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you're just going for shock factor, there's no like, emotional grip towards that. It's just like, oh, there's here's a bunch of monsters and blood and whatnot. Well, and I, I studied a lot of horror in grad school and I was writing High Lonesome Sound. Um, I actually literally took classes on horror fiction, which is so fun. Um, and, it, and the thing is, I didn't watch or read horror for a really long time because I had this imagination that, especially with movies, I just can't get images out of my head once they're in there. So I would just be terrorized by certain things from movies. But then when I started, and so I didn't read the books for a long time because I thought it would be the same experience. But then when I started taking the classes and learning about the genre, I was like, oh, it's a completely different world. Like, first of all, there's character development and there's, um, there's other things besides the scary stuff in the books. And I control what I imagine and visualize from them. But I think a lot of people don't read horror fiction because they think of slasher films, uh, which are their own thing, and a lot of people like them, and that's great. But I think um, I think that there are, there is a like a whole genre of horror that's just meant to shock. And if you're somebody that's looking for a story, that's not what you want to see, you know? Yeah, I feel like every genre has that niche where it's like, it's just meant there for, to be uh, the shock or entertain, just pure entertainment value uh, for some people. Like, I mean, romance has like, um, those, uh, those those shows that come on at like, in, in the middle of the afternoon or whatever. It's like, what are, the, what are those called? Um, I'm forgetting them right now, but I mean, it's like, there are mindless action movies too. It's like, it's not just, the horror genre that that does that so i feel like every genre has has their oh, black sheep because it, i don't think they're black sheep. i think that they're in every genre there's a spectrum there's people who like you see this uh i'm fascinated with this because it's like stuff i studied in school that um like people who really understand the reason their genre is the way it is. Why Why are there these tropes? Why is this the structure we use to tell this kind of story? This is the kind of emotional experience the readers are looking for. When you have something that's really thoughtful and understands that, they are said to sort of transcend genre. But they're not transcending genre, they're elevating it. They're basically saying, like, this is, the, this is why the genre works really well. But then you have people who are like, well, I just want to write stories in that genre without sort of understanding all of that other stuff. And they just want to write something that's fun. Well, there's readers for all of those books. You know, there are readers for, you know, romance novels that are just, you know, like, you know, uh, like a quick read that, you know, is formulaic, but that's what you want. You want to go have an escape and know that the, the couple's going to end up together and, you know, nothing too bad's going to happen and you're trying to just escape your life. So you go read that book. And then there are people who are looking for a more complex, layered experience, you know. So, you know, I try not to be too much of a snob about anything because I'm like, there's readers for everybody. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting when you see new people come into a genre that they've never really read or understood before, because then they get in trouble. Like, you know, you find it in romance, you'll have a, a new writer who's like, oh, I'm going to revolutionize romance. And then the heroine dies at the end of the book. And like, they don't even realize that's not a romance. That by definition, that's a tragedy that you just wrote, but you don't understand genre well enough to know that. So, oh. That cat really yep. said hi. Yeah, she 
she's very very friendly but it's like I said she treats my laptop like a uh, like a pillow sometimes <laughs> um, so I guess we touched like slightly on like uh, guilty pleasures what what would be your guilty pleasure in either books movies or in real life well I don't I don't love the idea of a guilty pleasure, you know, like term, um, because I don't, you know, like feel guilty about the stuff I like. Um, I mean, I do, you know, I get it. Uh, I, well, like my favorite thing, I love the great British Bake Off. Uh, I don't feel guilty about it. It's just something that's just pure. It's just happy. You know, like I can just escape and not, you know, everybody's nice. <laughs> they make delicious food. Yeah. You know, like my guilty pleasures now are like things that get me away from the news and <laughs> like, um, what else? Guilty pleasures. Um, I don't know. You know, like I, I have a really low brow <laughs> guilty pleasure. Like I like teen sex romp movies you know what i mean like those terrible movies like they're like obviously geared towards like 16 year old boys who are like going off with their friends to go meet the girl they met online i love stuff like that like it's just um and i like uh i don't know i just like fun stuff i like everything i read everything i read all the different genres i you know i like indie films and I also like really cheesy formulaic escapist stuff yeah. you know I just it's uh I'm not precious about it I'll watch pretty much anything I mean I do I do get um I'm terrible to watch movies with and TV shows because I'm always like oh that's the guy like <laughs> and I'm like it's him and it is it always is him um and I've got my husband doing it now too but uh so anything really that I can turn that writer's brain off and just sort of relax into it and not overthink it is a, a pleasure. Yeah. So. Yeah, I guess when I hear the term guilty pleasures, I, I don't feel guilty about stuff that I watch either. But uh, there's stuff that it's I watch and I enjoy. And it's, I, I acknowledge that it's bad. Like mm -hmm. Sharknado is probably one of the popular ones. Uh, so I, 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 it's ridiculous, but I, I love it. Well, like I just the entire series of um, Queer as Folk, um, which was a really important show, you know, but it also was terribly written. And whatever, I can, I like could not look away. Like I was a binging. All five, and part of it was that Netflix was like, oh, all these seasons are coming down February 1st. So it's like, I gotta watch them all before they go away. So, like, five seasons I watched in like three weeks. But, um, so I'll do, you know, I do stuff like that all the time. So, I'm just, you know, normal consumer of entertainment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it's important to be open to, uh, not just your genre, but other genres as well. So that way, it's like when you bring in like the romantic elements to your series, it's not like an alien uh, concept to you. Well, especially if you're blending genres too, you kind of need to understand how all of the genres you're using work, so that you can kind of deconstruct them and build a new thing from it. Um, which is something that you only get by watching and reading a lot of that stuff and kind of internalizing the structures of all of it. So also it's just fun. Who wants to, you know, I don't want to eat the same thing every day. Right. Exactly. You know, sometimes I want to read, you know, some magical realism. Sometimes I want to read, you know, a serial killer book. Sometimes I want to, you know, read a Burbana comedy. Like it's just whatever I'm in the mood for. Yeah. Um, so what's, uh, so a lot has changed for you a little bit with the self-publishing thing. Uh, what's what's next for you? Like, um, what is your current work in progress outside of uh, the auto books for High Lonesome Sound? Well, I just 
today opened up the file for the fifth Prospero book and started looking through it. I wrote a draft of it last year and kind of set it aside because I had a lot of personal stuff going on. So I pulled it out today and started reading it. And I was like, hey, this isn't so bad. Maybe I can fix this. So right now my plan is to get that book done because um, I've been getting lots of emails from very patient readers um, asking when the book was coming out. Um, and then from there, I don't know what I want to do. I mean, I'll, I want to do seven books in the series, um, but I'm, I'm also not feeling like, oh, I've got to put a book out every three months. I, that, that doesn't do anybody any favors if I do that. Um, certainly not my readers. Um, so my plan is to finish the series, uh, eventually and maybe do some new stuff. I don't know. I'm just kind of getting back into writing after doing a break to do a lot of teaching and uh, I'm still teaching through this group called Writers Workshop Dallas. Um, I'm teaching classes online and in person for them on novel writing, which is really fun. So I'm just doing a little bit of everything and I don't know. How is, uh, how is working with um, newer writers or... Um maybe aspiring writers isn't the best term, but uh, how does that change your perspective on uh, writing or the creative process? Well, it helps for why I started writing. Um, you know, and because uh, you can get really jaded after a while in the business. Um, and so you sort of remember that whole, just that drive to be creative and to express something, which is you know, when you start out, it's more important than, oh, is it, you know, are my readers going to like this? Is a publisher, publishers buying this now? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and I think every time I teach something, I learn something new about writing, too. Um, and it may be from reading um, pages that they, that somebody sent in, and I'm like, oh, they did this thing, and it really works, and here's why. And so I'm constantly sort of learning about different elements of the craft, and I've also been doing a lot of um, editing. I have some private developmental editing clients. Um, and so it's really fun to work with them too and sort of mentor them through the process. And um, so I think it's really honed my um, understanding of structure and the things that work and the things that don't work. But it's also given me um, the ability to sort of be more forgiving with myself about writing because the thing is, I mean, so it's all so subjective. And while there are certain things like, you know, voice and, and things, um, the story that, that you write that I may not love, somebody else would absolutely love it. And so it's, it's made me be a little bit more objective about even my own work that when I'm like, oh, that's not good enough. Well, it's, it is good enough. I'm just being too hard on myself about it. So it's, it's really fun. That's a, that's a really fun thing that, um, it just keeps me in love with, with stories, I think, to teach it. How do you go about setting your classrooms up? Uh, did, did you me with a certain program or school or so writing Dallas um, was started locally by um, a great guy named Pete Kinsey uh, who has a master's degree from UCLA um, and he's a professor at UT University of Texas at Dallas and he um, saw a sort of an opening for a place that offered really good craft classes to writers and everything from short fiction to novels to screenwriting, poetry, um, for people who didn't want to go and get a degree in it, um, but who were serious about it, to bring sort of professional writers and aspiring professional writers together um, in an approachable way. So we offer eight-week classes, uh, workshops that have, you know, it's sort of like taking a college class, but it's only two months long and it's cheaper usually. Um, and so the in-person classes, we use usually only eight people in them, which is nice because you can really get to know everybody and work with them. 
Um, and you know, we do critique and I do lectures and things like that. And the online classes are really similar. There's still the critique element and I post lectures and interact with them. I also, um, I don't know that all the instructors do this, but I do. I also set up a 30 minute to an hour long Skype with them so that, yeah, I can say like, where are you? How can I, where are you right now and how can I help you get to where you want to be? So it's a more personalized experience. It's really stuff that I wish I had had access to when I was starting out. Yeah. It's, it's, there's that saying, it's like, be the person that you needed when, when you were younger yeah. or at your, or at the early stage. I think that's a really good saying. Well, and so much to do is really just encourage them not to quit, you know? And, um, demystifying a lot of stuff a lot of writing education um isn't good i mean it's it can be actually very harmful for aspiring writers like if people are like you have to plot well literally not everybody has to plot some people plotting will kill a book for them yeah um so to say everybody has to come up with an outline at the beginning of class, well, that's really counterproductive for a lot of people. So I actually do a lot of work on like, what's your Myers-Briggs type? Let's figure out how you're wired um, to tell stories and then figure out how you you specifically need to sort of get in alignment with, with what works best for you. And I think that that's one of the things that I love doing is I have you know a decade of experience being around, talking to professional writers, editors, agents. I know the writers see, you know, sort of the plan together versus what they say online about their struggles. And so I can sit down with a new writer and be like, look, what you're going through is completely normal. Nobody talks about it because we don't want to seem like we're insecure, but this is a completely normal thing. So it's a lot about demystifying writing is that's really fun for me. I, I think that's great because, uh, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of times in the classroom environment, you don't get, like, the individual treatment. They just try to, sometimes teachers will just try to get out the, the basic formula, but they, humans are complicated creatures. Everybody thinks differently. I mean, you put ten people in a room, you get ten different opinions. Yeah. Well, and I see it more like a ship than a, you know, I, you know, cause I'm not giving out grades. It's not, um, I'm not teaching, uh, you know, some curriculum that's been handed to me. Like I create my own curriculum, you know, I pick the books that we read and I, you know, I just try and meet everybody where they are and say, what do you need for me to move the ball down the field for you a little bit, you know? So yeah, yeah. I enjoy that. I, I had a teacher in high school that would not let you read Stephen King because she thought they hurt his stories were too scary. And so I, I kept begging her, so I, I really wanted to do a study on one of his books. Um, and she just out, I refused it. But I kind of found a way around it because I picked up a book by Richard Bachman. <laughs> um, and she never realized what I did. But I... So I, I don't know how you feel about sensory in the classroom but do you how do you tackle or view something like that oh yeah i i think stuff like that has turned more people off of reading than anything you know um and writing i you know it's it's a tricky thing in the class right because you bring these people together these eight people who are strangers and you know a lot of people when they start out are writing like fictionalized versions of their own life and so you have to really it's a challenge to create an environment in a classroom that is safe for everybody um, where everybody feels like they can express their opinions and, and their ideas and whatever in a way that is respected and respectful because you know we have people of all different political beliefs, religion beliefs, um, all that stuff, you know, and some people might bring in like a serial killer story and some people might bring in an erotic romance and then somebody else might have like a Christian fiction. Um, so that's one of the fun challenges for me as a writer is like, how do I get all these people working together? Um, and every now and then you have like a, somebody who's a little more difficult and, um, but I mean, my view is just, I just try and respect everybody's point of view. And as 
and if somebody says something that I think isn't respectful, I'll call them on it. Um, but also, in, I think like one of the big ways is um, when, when you're dealing with, with issues with um, people writing about um, topics that are like sexist or racist or things like that, um, you know, sometimes it's really, it's laziness. So I think if you can approach it from that point of view, like this is lazy writing as opposed to you're a racist or you're a sexist, they may be. Um, but I think, you know, my job in class is not to scream at people and tell them they're a racist. My job is to say, I would take another look at this because this is how it's coming across and um, you need to think about this and this and this, and what if you tried it this way, and you know, a, a, a more nuanced treatment of the craft would involve this, and so it's, um, it's a challenge in a good way to sort of figure out how to talk to everybody, um, and I try not to, though, discourage anybody from, you know, if somebody wants to write something that's not my cup of tea to read, I'm not going to say, oh, you shouldn't write that. That's not serious writing. I think any act of writing is brave. Yeah. So, um, I, I would never, ever say you can't write this. Now, I have had people who have written things that I felt were... Um, you know they were done sort of in a way that was betrayed some ignorance. I would never, I didn't use that word, but you sort of kind of guide them in a different direction. Um, but I don't know. Wouldn't, um, I would never say don't read a book cause it's too scary. I think you can't, I don't think you can teach I don't think you can teach and be censoring. I don't think it's, you're not teaching them. Cause it, like we, you like, it's a teachable moment to come up against something that's uncomfortable yeah. and learn how to deal with it. You don't say never, I mean, we're going to prevent people from ever being uncomfortable because then you have no skills for dealing with it. If it's uncomfortable, you know? So I don't know, but it's tricky. I mean, I don't teach teenagers either. I teach adults. Yeah. So I think it gives me a little more leeway. Right. You know, my son's school, you know, I thought about, you know, my son's in high school and I've talked to some of his English teachers about stuff people, you know, parents complain about. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I could never work here. There was some parent complained that they were teaching about empathy. They, they had a, a unit on empathy in this one class and these parents complained because they said that the, the teachers were trying to um, promote a liberal agenda by discussing the concept of empathy in class. Wow. Yeah, so I just would not have, I, I would not be able to be diplomatic in that situation. It's but. tricky. So I want to ask you three, three closing questions that may or may not have to do with writing, kind of like what we did last time. Okay. Um, what, uh, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? My favorite flavor of ice cream is a toss up between Chunky Monkey and Cherries Garcia, but I cannot have them anymore because I'm lactose intolerant. Really? Mm-hmm. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Yeah, getting old sucks. I mean, I think that they make a non-dairy version, so I could probably have that. I'm sure they do. I mean, with the technology we have now, I'd be surprised if we didn't have the ability to do that. True. Um, and speaking of technology, what's the biggest technological advancement we've had most recently that you think is like, wow, that's really cool? Hmm. I don't... That's a tough one, because I... I'm kind of a Luddite and I, um, I think a lot of technology scares me. Um, and I think that's because I'm a writer. And so I think about like dystopia a lot. Yeah. Yeah, sure. 
and my husband's in IT, and he's a security uh, director for a .com, and so I hear a lot about about misuses of privacy and things like that. So I'm kind of paranoid about that stuff a little. Um, I don't know. The biggest advance, I'm like, wow. Wow. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of medical advances that, like, my husband was in the hospital last week. He had a blood clot from a hockey injury. And, you know, they, like, took an ultrasound of his leg, and you could see each of the individual veins in which they were different colored depending on which way the blood was flowing. And every now and then I'm just struck by these things that for us are like, oh, well, of course we can do that. Yeah. But, like, a hundred years ago... I mean, that's alien technology, you know, it's, um, and it, my husband probably wouldn't have survived something that ended up, you know, being fine, you know? So, uh, probably the medical stuff, uh, shocks me the most. That's not a very good answer, but. No, no, I think that's a terrific answer. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind boggling how far we've made it and, you know, just a hundred years isn't that long in the scope of all things. Yeah. Um, well, and it's amazing how much we can get granular on things like that, but then also so much we don't understand yet about the body. Like, why do we have hiccups? Who knows? You know, like there's things like that that like doctors are like, well, this works, but we don't know why. Well, you know, like it's just it's an interesting combination of like advancement and then just ignorance that's very fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's no cure for the common cold. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, lastly, what uh, what is your most anticipated thing for this year? Um. Well, this is a big, this is an exciting thing. Uh, my husband and I are actually thinking about buying a condo in New Orleans. Because uh, it's my favorite place to go. I've set several books there, and I want to use it as like a writing escape thing. So we, we're not quite ready to pull the trigger yet, but that's something that's sort of keeping me. I'm spending a lot of time on real estate sites. Like, yeah. <laughs> but like you know, it's like fun. It's like a fun project that we're looking into. But um, yeah, that's probably the biggest one. Um, I don't know. I, I'm really fo focusing so much more now on just not of just trying to be, this is going to sound so woo woo, but just being more present and like enjoying day by day instead of like, if I just hold on in six months, I have this cool thing happening, you know? Cause that's, that's really what like being on that, that cycle of publication is it's like, okay, once this book is done and it comes out, everything will be great on release day. Like it's just, holding everything off until you can turn the book in and I, I just am trying not to be in that headspace anymore yeah it's, it's important to live in the moment uh, uh, my dad always says that it's it's the journey not the destination that matters yep. the most uh, well Jay thanks always uh, so much for, for joining me make sure that you follow her on Twitter watch out for her books on Amazon and check out her webpage all the links for that will be listed below thank you so much Thank you.